Just at the Defense Intelligence Agency. Seth Jones here in the yellow tie. He holds the uh, Harold Brown Chair at uh, CSIS, Director of the International Threats Project. Prior to CSIS, he was uh, at the RAND Corporation, is the author of many books, has served in key defense posts, and his PhD is from the University of Chicago. And finally, Nancy Youssef, our old friend and a good friend of CSIS. Uh, she is the national, one of the national security correspondents now for the Wall Street Journal. She has won numerous awards for her work with the uh, McClatchy and Knight Ritter uh, newspapers, has served as various times as uh, their Pentagon correspondent and bureau chief in both Baghdad uh, and in Cairo. So with that, let's try to untangle what's going on uh, right now in Syria. And, and uh, John, let me just start with you. Uh, give us the latest news, because it, everything changes in every news cycle. Something new happens and something else is taken away. What is the situation right now in Syria? Are we in, are we out, are we in the process of leaving? Uh, just how would you sum up the, the latest news about Syria? We are in the process of getting out. We are working out the precise modalities of it. What I find disturbing, to be honest, is the way we're getting out means we have almost no control, or much less control than we would otherwise have over what we leave behind. It seems to me that this, the US strategic goal in Syria should be that we grasp the fact that, that, that what will really matter, what will endure in Syria, is what's negotiated between the parties going forward. And by announcing that we are summarily withdrawing, we have taken ourselves out of those negotiations. We've undermined our leverage in those negotiations. And just as the president, as a candidate, criticize the Obama administration for don't tell your enemy what you're going to do. It's precisely the same thing. If he had negotiated over the terms of the American withdrawal, he could have gotten concessions from the Assad government, from the Iranians, from the Russians, from the Turks, all of whom have interests in this area the US is going to leave. But by saying we're leaving unconditionally and immediately, all of those parties will make all of their own deals and U.S. interests and, and the, the U.S. ability to influence what endures was reduced overnight from a reasonable amount to virtually zero. Melissa, uh, let me ask you, uh, why should we be concerned about this? A lot of times people say, what were we doing there in the first place? Whether we should have been there or not been there, we were there. And now we're dealing with what do we do next? Thanks, Bob. And it's a true pleasure to be joining this distinguished uh, panel and, and joining all of you for the discussion this evening on this important topic. I think it really boils down to, to three main issues in terms of why Syria matters to, to the United States. Um, what happens in Syria doesn't stay in Syria. I think we've seen whether it's uh, terrorism threats, the spread of refugees, and, and the hu terrible humanitarian situation, uh, that the spillover effects of, of conflict and stability in Syria has manifold effects in the region, into Europe, um, and in ways that I think were very hard to forecast, um, rolling back to the Tate to 2011, 2012 timeframe um, when we saw the, the grassroots revolutionary movement in, in Syria uprising. I think the, the other piece to, to keep in mind is that our competitors uh, can very easily fill the gaps um, into which uh, we, we are departing. Um, they have been actively exploiting our vulnerabilities in the region for the last few years, whether that's Russia um, in 2015 inserting itself into Syria, Iran certainly over the last decade increasing its destabilizing activities in the region and now through its activities and capability development in Syria itself, uh, mounting an expeditionary military capability uh, that, that can be leveraged in, in multiple ways, uh, whether it's in, in Yemen, 
um, in other places in, in the region. Um, and U.S. forces working in close proximity to these competitors has afforded these competitors an opportunity to learn um, from, from our operations and put stress on uh, U.S. operators in ways that we haven't been accustomed to in, in many years. And now with a rapid withdrawal, they will not only be learning from their experience in working in close proximity with us, but able to exploit other opportunities down the road um, when we will inevitably be in contested environments with them. And I think the third uh, priority that, that stands out is, is a normative one um, in terms of the, the erosion of, of accountability, um, whether that's looking at the use of chemical weapons in Syria um, and how that um, long-standing principle um, prohibiting the use of chemical weapons in, in warfare has significantly eroded in the international community's uh, failure to, to really act um, to, to uphold that. Um, certainly the use of conventional weapons, uh, even more so in Syria in terms of loss of life, um, has eroded the norms of warfare in terms of targeting hospitals, um, civilian targets, bakeries, um, in an incredible loss of life um, and threats to civilians and, and some deep questions in terms of the conduct of, of our own forces and the partners that, that we work with um, in, in these situations uh, in, in terms of um, the reliance on, on air power, on the, the reliance on local partners to achieve our, our local security objectives. There are good reasons to use these capabilities but when we consider a withdrawal that, that is rapid, we need to be thoughtful about how we tie off these engagements responsibly. Um, and I fear that there is not a, a careful ca calculation being made uh, for, for that in a rapid withdrawal. You know, I, uh, in preparing for this panel, I, I was reading some things written by jo uh, Tony Cordesman, who is just prolific and truly an expert on this part of the world and a lot of other parts of the world as well. And, and he wrote that he went so far as to say, and this is his quote, the president has literally placed the United States in a position where it is losing on all fronts. Now Seth, you told me before we came out here that you had a rather interesting experience uh, being on uh, C-SPAN the other day where you took questions from the audience. Uh, but that was not the tenor, apparently, that, that the people who were calling you uh, had. Yeah, uh, I, I've obviously written on this subject quite a bit recently and laid out some concerns about what John mentioned earlier, uh, the, how withdrawal was done and the terms under which it was done. I, I wrote an opinion piece in Nancy's paper about a week and a half ago on concerns about the terrorism issue with the withdrawal. But one of the things that struck me in, uh, in the C-SPAN session, and it's one of the call-in shows, it was a morning hour where I had a discussion for the first 15 or 20 minutes, and then the rest of the series was taking calls from Republicans, Democrats, and then independents. Now, it's probably not entirely random sampling, but every person that called in, every person that called in was Republican, Democrat, Independent was supportive of withdrawal from Syria um, and, and, and wondered categorically why we were there, what our strategic interests were, and why we couldn't spend the money that we were using in Syria, and not just Syria but Afghanistan, at home uh, overseas, uh, in, instead of overseas. So, uh, I mean, in that case, pretty clear domestic support for withdrawing U.S. forces from uh, Syria and at least downsizing in Afghanistan. Nancy, what do you think the uh, the impact of this is going to be for the rest of that region? Well, I'll start with Syria because, as as you know, there are more than 2,000 troops there, and the U.S. isn't talking about bringing those troops home. They're talking about placing them in places like Iraq and Kuwait and the neighboring countries, and essentially having them parachute in as needed. So from a military perspective, one of the things you hear at the Pentagon is that brings with it its own risk. When you're parachuting in and not there all the time, and you're depending on local partners who, in, in this case the Kurds, who we would feel um, abandoned, that, that, that 
increases the risk to the troops and it and reduces your understanding and ability to sort of shape events. Broadly, I think what you're starting to hear is um, talk about growing um, influence for Russia, for Iran, um, in the absence of a U.S. presence there. Um, Russia obviously has always had influence in, in, in Syria given its relationship and it has um, a base there. And of course, Iran has done the same thing. Um, they, the, you, talk, you hear a lot to talk about a land bridge from um, Iran through the Middle East that th that'll be facilitated by the U.S. withdrawal. Now, the counter to, to that argument is that, that, that because they've had a long-standing influence there, maybe they don't, the U.S. presence doesn't affect it as much, right? Because do they really need a land bridge if you're Iran to have influence in the region or, or in Syria? Arguably, they, they, they do already and, um, and had that even before the U.S. was there and likewise with Russia. The, the most immediate thing I think you're seeing right now is um, a region operating where the U.S. isn't the dominant influencing force. And I think we saw this most recently with the strikes um, that was launched between Israel and, and, and Iranian forces in Syria, where you had Russia sort of making their case and Iran sort of asserting its influence and Israel defending itself. And there, you could feel the absence of U.S. influence there. So when we think broadly in terms of the effect on the region, I think ultimately it's one where the U.S. isn't the leading negotiator in all this and that you all go from a sort of a unipolar managed Middle East to a multipolar one. Why? Uh, and whoever knows the answer to this question, just speak up, don't wait to be called on. Uh, why did the president do this? Does anybody have any inside information? Does anybody have a thought? Uh, what do you, John? So, um, so my understanding is that the president has been very clear that he wanted to do this and people in his government were kind of ignoring him and weren't carrying out his actions. And you had the National Security Advisor announcing in September that we were gonna stay in Syria as long as Iran had troops outside of Iran, which is a pretty bold statement, which apparently never rep represented the president's views. And I think the president became very frustrated that his government was not following his direction and he said, I'm just going to do it. And it, to me, it, it highlights a problem, which is the US government is set up to consider different options and consider different perspectives and push things up through a bureaucracy to present a set of options, which are then discussed in front of the president and the president makes a decision. And to me, the way the Syria announcement was made it suggests that entire system is broken. It validates the concerns I've heard that the system is broken, that the president doesn't get considered decisions. He doesn't consider various options. His government doesn't follow his directions. And the way it works is the president either issues a tweet or makes a statement, and people react to that. But if he's not doing it, they're not reacting. And to me, that creates a whole set of challenges most importantly for American allies. Because if you want to help the United States, it becomes very hard to figure out where the United States is going and what's considered helpful. Yeah, uh, Bob, I gotta add two, two things to this. One is, you know, the Trump administration now has two years under its belt uh, from January um, uh, 2017 now to January 2019. Mm -hmm. And I think it's worth asking, with two years gone by, what is a, what's sort of the Trump doctrine for foreign policy? And what it, what it is increasingly looking like is a foreign policy that looks a lot like, um, not, not um, isolationism, uh, because I wouldn't call it isolationist, but it's much, it's much more one of, of what you might call restraint. And that is a foreign policy that minimizes um, the use of military forces in some areas, and for him, the Middle East and I think South Asia are areas where uh, he does not see a strategic interest, at least at this point. Uh, China represents slightly, a slightly different situation where I think the president, and you can see it both with the trade wars and the way he speaks about China, is an area where he sees some competition. Um, and so I think in that sense, we see a deployment of military forces into the Asia-Pacific region, 
Uh, Iran is sort of interesting. It's the U.S. has pulled out of the, the nuclear deal. Uh, Iran does represent an area of some competition, but it makes the Syria withdrawal almost ironic because by pulling U.S. forces out the way he has, and terms and conditions are, uh, you know, the, the, the Iranians now have an ability to move into more vacuums in Syria, uh, particularly now in areas of the east than they had um, in the past. So both the Iranians and the Russians have, uh, ha have the ability to move into the vacuum as the U.S. pulls out. But I think this does reflect a, a Trump policy of what I would call restraint now. Yeah, no, I, just to, to add a couple of points, um, one to um, highlight an important observation that my colleague Alice Friend wrote about a couple of weeks ago, which is it, it really is the president's call to decide um, how the military will be deployed around the world. This is civilian control of the military. Where the breakdown occurs, is, as John is highlighting, is in the process of teeing up the, the options, the risks and trade-offs that are inherent in that decision making. Um, and how to shore up U.S. strategic interests in, in the aftermath and have actually a plan for, for executing uh, the president's decision. So I think that's, that's what we're seeing play out. Um, the, the other piece that, that I would highlight is that um, the, this, this is reflective, I think, not only of the president's um, global viewpoint, but it is broader than that. If you look at recent uh, public opinion polling by, by the Pew um, it, organization, about half of Americans don't believe that um, America has achieved its strategic objectives in Afghanistan. It's also about half that believe um, that, that we should be pulling out of Syria. So I think there is an active conversation to be had in the U.S. Um, and perhaps looking forward to to future election cycles in terms of the, the future course of, of our foreign policy, the role of the U.S. military in achieving our foreign policy objectives. I would like to see um, a defense policy in the region that does recalibrate the use of, of military force and actually right sets the other tool sets uh, at the disposal of the United States, our, our diplomatic, our economic levers that are incredibly powerful and arguably more in need in, in this region. I, I, the part that bothers me is I'm beginning to wonder, does anybody know what our policy is? And when we don't know what the policy of the United States is, the rest of the world, I think that puts us in a more dangerous position. In fact, I think that's the most dangerous position one can be in when people don't know what the United States stands for, what we we're prepared to do, uh, when we're prepared to do it, and and under under what circumstances. So Nancy. You, I think it's a great question, and it really gets at something we haven't experienced, and, and, and other panels have talked about this in the past. You'd have a principals meeting, and there'd be private deliberations of all the possible options and what the costs were associated with it, what would be the best option, and then an announcement would be made. This is how the U.S. is going to proceed going forward. And right now you have the opposite, where the sort of end state is announced first, and then we are sort of publicly seeing the deliberations happen, right? And so in the case of Syria, you'll hear the U.S. is withdrawing in 30 days or 60 days or there's not a date or it's only going to leave when, ISIS, when Iran's been contained and ISIS is completely um, defeated. So for me as a military correspondent, the thing that I turn to is those things that get outside of rhetoric. And, so in the case of Syria, there's a document that the Pentagon produces. It's called an execution order. And of course, there has to be an acronym for it, an exhort. And that actually spells out the US mission, military mission, in Syria. And so I think when searching for what the policy is, you have to, I think, for those following, get around the rhetoric and try to get those concrete things. It's why you've heard General Miller in Afghanistan and General Neller, the commandant when he was there, say, we don't have any orders to change anything. What they're turning to is sort of tangible descriptions of the policy because this sort of swirl of public rhetoric has created confusion. And I think for all of you who are, who are astute observers of these topics, I think those are the sort of anchors you look for because I think if you keep following the rhetoric, you're basically following an internal deliberation playing out publicly. Um, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say the other area where, where the rhetoric has, I think, been problematic is statements by some policymakers, including this week, that, the, the, that one of the rationales 
for withdrawing forces from Syria is that the Islamic State has been defeated, or even that the, 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 the caliphate has been defeated. And I think one has to look very carefully at the evidence that we have. Um, we put out a report here at CSIS back in November and found that the largest numbers of both Salafi jihadist groups, includes the Islamic State, and the largest number of fighters anywhere in the world is still in Syria right now. That the Islamic State has not been defeated. They continue to conduct attacks as we recently saw in Manbij. And by the way, on the uh, western part of Syria, in the Idlib area, we have the largest uh, concentration of Al-Qaeda-linked fighters anywhere in the globe right now, uh, operating under the group Hayat Tahrir al-Sham. So uh, it, it is disingenuous to argue that a reason we should leave is because we have defeated the Islamic State when the reality on the ground, I think anybody who's looked at the terrorism picture in Syria would say uh, that while ISIS has lost virtually all the territory it once controlled, it still has large numbers of operatives involved in guerrilla attacks, clandestine operations, and is in the process of attempting to recreate it. So um, I think the, the facts are important rather than just the rhetoric here. Do you agree with that, Melissa? Yes, um, I, I would agree with, with that assessment. And I think it, it's equally important to think about um, you know, the need to sustain capabilities in the region, if not in Syria, then you know, in, the, in the perimeter countries, as Nancy was describing, to address those challenges with our partners. But then also, what is the other side of the equation? How do we get ourselves out of this cycle of perpetually fighting counterterrorism operations for, for decades? It's, it's the stabilization piece. It's those other tools of, of statecraft that empower local partners to um, establish local governance on their own terms and in ways that can connect to a broader political process. And that's the areas that we are continuing to fail to invest in um, that we really need to up our game. You know, I, I thought it was interesting, uh, and you saw it again when Mattis left, when, uh, and I don't say this to promote my own interview, uh, but when I interviewed Rex Tillerson, uh, and I asked him, I asked him two just, you know, very open questions. Uh, how would you describe Donald Trump was the first one, and the other one was, when did your relationship go off the rails? And when I asked him about that, he said, I think he, he, I'm paraphrasing what he said, but he said, I think basically he just got tired of me telling him he couldn't do things. Said he would propose things and I would say, you know, if you want me to go up on the hill and, and uh, advocate for that and so forth, I can do that. But Mr. President, you can't do that, that's illegal. And he said, I think he just got tired of me being the one who kept telling him that. And uh, when I had asked him in the beginning, how would he describe uh, the president, he said, well, he doesn't read, uh, he's uninformed, uh, he will not take a briefing, and he's not very interested in much more uh, in what people have to say to him, which uh, I thought was pretty astonishing. But then, you know, a couple of weeks after that, the Syria thing happens and Mattis leaves. Uh, and if you look at what his letter said, it basically said the same, the same thing. And now you've got the chief of staff who's gone, and if you go back and look at some of the things he said and what they're now quoting him, uh, sources are, who know him, are saying, it sounds like it all comes down to that. He does not like to be challenged, and when he makes up his mind, uh, that's the way he sees it, and he's not gonna be dissuaded from it. But I, I, I just, I, <laughs> I don't know why, maybe it's just because no one ever quotes him, but I, when all of this happens, I, I keep going back to Martin Van Buren. I mean, you don't hear many people <laughs> quote Martin Van Buren. Old Kinderhook. Who, the fact was, he was, you know, he was uh, Andrew Jackson's vice president, and he was uh, a master uh, politician. But he said at one point that government should not be operated uh, based on the excitement of the moment, but on sound and sober second thought. And I, I think that's one of the things that may be missing here now, but that's just my opinion clearly underlined. Yeah, I, I think what you're getting at is, is it feels to me like the president is fairly separated from his government. And maybe that's natural because the president didn't come up from, through government. 
he hasn't been engaged in these processes. But, but when I read about the way the White House works, there's a way in which the president is normally deeply engaged and pushes people and pushes things back. But it's a give and take where the president is totally enmeshed in the machinery of government. And two years in, the president seems to, to, to uh, strain against the, 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 the machinery of government and say, but I think this is what it should be. But the government doesn't work that way. The government doesn't work on big, broad pronouncements. The government works on, OK, so these are the 17 things and the eight subpoints and, and going down and down and down, and with an up and down, which the president seems rather pointedly divorced from. And that, and the, I think and the, and the historic question is whether the job of being president has changed such that we're going to have more presidents who haven't come out of government whose approach is that, or whether this is just an anomalous president. And it's, frankly, too early to tell. But what, what, one thing we're missing, and I think when we look at historical administrations that take momentous steps, whether it's introducing uh, U.S. forces or aid packages the way we had after World War II when Truman introduces the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan, uh, or any other periods like that in American history, even when we're withdrawing, is is the, the president uses venues, whether it's national television or major speeches, to outline the vision and the broader doctrine that is behind his decisions to put. And what, what, what we lack right now is we have to sort of guess what restraint looks like and what a policy of restraint looks like. What we don't have is a clearly articulated policy where we can, we don't have to agree with it, but we understand why he believes we're withdrawing, we should withdraw from, from Syria and downsize in Afghanistan. And we understand the, the vision, we understand the doctrine, and that these are steps that flow logically from that. That we're missing right now, and I think that we've seen in, I think, in a number of past presidents that have had to make these momentous decisions. But they've Nancy. often had a team Let, uh, Nancy concern. wanted to say one thing. Well, I'm just going to offer a contrarian view, just for the purposes of discussion, also because it's something <laughs> you hear um, from sources around, uh, around the topic of Syria. When the United States entered Syria in 2014, the policymakers then never answered the question of what would the U.S. exit look like. It, they never and that's true. Right, that never answered either, and, and it was clear from the beginning it was going to go one of two ways. Either the U.S. would in some way abandon the Kurds or would be there in perpetuity. This was something that came up under the Obama administration, again, under the Trump administration. And this president was clear that he wanted to get out of Syria. He announced it as, as far back as April of last year. And I think one of the takeaways, and again, this is just a contrarian view that you hear, is that one of the responsibilities of the military and policymakers who put forward these ideas is to answer the question of how to get out. Because I think the argument you hear is by not doing so, you leave the, the, the strategy of Syria vulnerable to, uh, to a president who has said, I want out. And so and again, this is, I'm not sharing a political view. I really want to just get it. I want to just sort of challenge yeah. how we think about these issues because you heard from the viewers on C-SPAN and from others this, this exhaustion with these wars. And I think part of it is that there's been a failure to really answer um, how these conflicts end, what a resolution looks like, what does an end state look like. The open-endedness of it, of both Syria and Afghanistan, arguably has, have left both strategies vulnerable. I think that's, those are very good points, right? No, John, and, and I'm not arguing with either the yeah, president's yeah. prerogative or even, sure. you know, you can argue about the justness of being in Syria, pulling out of Syria. You can argue that. I think the, the president is not well served by not having, not surrounding himself with trusted advisors who understand the levers of government and can lash him in to the government. And I think as a consequence, he feels more constrained and the government either ignores him, and I think we have a lot of evidence of the government sometimes ignoring him, or not understanding where he's trying to go. And it seems to me there is that ring of advisors, and it's partly the chief of staff, but it's others, who, ha I mean, the, the Michael Deavers and the Jim Bakers and the other people who have been key to making administrations work. And this administration doesn't have somebody like that. You could say it's Jared Kushner, but frankly, Jared Kushner doesn't understand enough 
about the way government works to play that role effectively. Well, you know, I have never thought trying to, and I spent a lot of years, I've spent 15 years covering Congress, and I was up on Capitol Hill. And in the offices where the congressmen, and they would all do it just so they could make the extra money, where they would make their, their wife the chief of staff, you know, it never worked. It, it never worked because the staff can't go to the guy's wife and say, he's really screwed up here. We've got to get this straightened out. And by, it, just, it just doesn't work. And, and I don't see that as a great strength. I mean, the man's welcome to have who he wants on his staff. That's one of his prerogatives as president. But bringing the kids in, I mean, it's, it's not the corner store. You know, it's, it's a little different than that. I mean, I, 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 I always, one of the questions I always ask uh, uh, people is, you know, you hear so many people who say if they, in, down in Texas where I come from, they pronounce it a business, not a business, but they say, you know, if they'd run it, run the government like a business, everything would be fine. Well, it's not a business and it won't be fine. And others have tried that and it never, it never, it never quite works out. But uh, I think we ought to, uh, before we go to questions from the audience, ought to talk a little bit more about Afghanistan. How, how is, Melissa, how is Afghanistan different from Syria, or is it? Yeah, no, I mean, I think with Afghanistan, it's, it's, it's a much longer commitment um, that the United States has made there. Um, it's with NATO um, and a broader coalition. Um, it's linked to 9-11 in terms of our immediate response in the aftermath of that and the Article 5 NATO invocation um, to, to respond to that. So there's a lot of political, strategic, emotional baggage uh, that I think uh, is subscribed to the Afghanistan question. And then there are the concrete realities of here we are 17 years in, um, the Taliban still presents a pretty significant threat to the stability of Afghanistan. Um, still looming questions in terms of where political negotiations are headed with the Taliban. Um, the resiliency of Afghan governance and their security structures if the U.S. begins a gradual withdrawal. Um, but again, we have been there for 17 years. We have done counterterrorism light. We have done counterinsurgency. We've gone back to more of a CT enabling model. Um, what really works, I think, is in worthy of review. The administration actually did a significant review uh, in, in the first year of, of the administration released a, a pretty good South Asia strategy in 2017 um, that, that articulated a policy position on Afghanistan and, and in the context of the broader region, um, addressing uh, some of the challenges with, with Pakistan as well. Um, and I think the, the added challenge for this administration is given how much emphasis they have placed on strategic competition with Russia and China, we also have to think about the withdrawal of U.S. troops and the leverage that that brings in South and Central Asia through that lens. As China is building One Belt, One Road, Russia has economic interests in in Afghanistan, Iran has interests in Afghanistan, and Afghanistan has actually been a potential opportunity to bring these convergence of interests together in, in prior eras of our experience in Afghanistan, but how all of this is strategically knit together, I think, are, are looming questions for this administration. Are, are we safer now than we were uh, two years ago? Are we safer because we've been in Afghanistan all that time or not? So, are we, I, well look, I, I think what we don't have at the moment is, uh, is terrorist organizations, particularly Al Qaeda, plotting significant attacks uh, directed either at the US homeland or at, at Western interests, let's say Europe, from Afghan territory right now. Uh, Al Qaeda exists in its local affiliate, which, which we call Al Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, but Al Qaeda's core has been <coughs> decimated pretty badly. I mean, the last major attack in the United States or plot tied to Afghanistan was 2009. It was the Najibullah Zazi plot, uh, which would have been three suicide bombers on New York City subway cars. Uh, he conducted training with Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, but that was 10 years ago now. So um, since then, 
uh, we've seen very little in the sense of external plotting from that country. And that's, that's to a great extent, U.S. operations on both sides of the Afghan-Pakistan border. Nancy? Well, uh, the only thing I would say is that the challenge with Afghanistan is how you withdraw could, could lead to that state becoming um, vulnerable to um, a place for jihadists to set up camp. And so the reason I think you're seeing the peace talks um, go the way they are and with such a focus on some sort of U.S. counterterrorism presence is a recognition by all sides, including the Taliban, that a precipitous withdrawal and collapse of the state would present problems for everybody involved. And so to your question, is the U.S. safer, it's not more endangered, it hasn't been more endangered, and, and the way the U.S. withdrawals will determine whether that remains the case. John, you want to... What do you um, think? I, I, look, I, first, in, in my successful turf battle, I've managed to have my turf end at the eastern border of Iran. So Afghanistan is not, 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 okay. <laughs> not my AOR. But um, yeah, I think the point that Melissa was making earlier is, is important. Let me put a different spin. It's not just about our sort of non military instruments. Um, I think we have to have a national discussion about, about what good enough looks like. Um, we have had pretty high ambitions for how we can transform societies, and, and the foundation of that has been Germany and Japan after World War II. Um, we've had a lot of pretty mixed experiences in the decades since. Uh, Vietnam seems to have done very well despite us. Um, but I think as a country, we have to have a much more open discussion about how good, good enough is, and how much we're willing to commit toward these things, because I think we end up expecting too much, expecting more than we're willing to invest. I mean, we get all caught, and then we start saying, oh, it's a failure. We can't, we can want everything to work out, but as a country, what are we really willing to invest? And I, I feel like we haven't had a serious discussion about that for you, decades. Do you, uh, do you all, all believe that the United States must remain engaged around the world. I mean, not be the world's yeah. policeman, but we can't. Uh, and sometimes, and I don't understand uh, Trump's strategy, but sometimes it seems to me is what he wants to do is create this enormous military, but keep it here in the United States. With a wall. With, behind a wall. That's right. Uh, <laughs> Look, I, and, and to me, the great force multiplier of the United States and, the, and the, the, the genius of the post-war order has been a lot of countries have wanted to help us. Yeah, I, I think the clearest, Bob, the clearest strategic document to come out of the administration was the one overseen by Secretary Mattis, it was the National Defense Strategy. And that national defense strategy outlined U.S. interests in terms of competition with the Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans, and the Iranians. That's the closest we've had, but obviously Secretary Mattis is not uh, in the administration anymore. But I think what it, what it highlights, if that document is close to being accurate, is that for the U.S. to move out and to not engage in some areas, I'm not talking about large numbers of military forces, but not to engage it means somebody else will. And if we're not careful, we're not gonna have partners there that, th that have similar values. They're gonna be competitors. And so I think that's, that's where this, this becomes important because if it's not us there, then who's there who's and there? is that in our interest? That's, that's a very good place to take a pause here and take some questions. Who has one? Right there. You, you, right here, behind the white hat, I think somebody. Yeah, here we go. Tell us who you are. Thank you we so much. Uh, this is uh, Mohammed Shafiq. I'm an Afghan. And an Mike up close. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, I would like to quickly say that the situation in Afghanistan or the relationship between Afghanistan and the United States is different from Iraq and Syria and, and elsewhere because we do have a strategic partnership, we do have a bilateral security agreement, and we do have a, a states of force agreement with the United States. 
while in Syria and Iraq, uh, it's not the case. So when we talk about withdrawal from Afghanistan, I think it should be uh, based on negotiations and deals between the partner, as well as uh, based on a settlement. So my quick question will be, uh, you know, uh, I know that there is a common say that it's easy to go to Afghanistan, but hard to get out of Afghanistan. What will be the alternative in case of any withdrawal or partial withdrawal? What will be the alternative of the United States presence in Afghanistan? For sure, in Syria and other countries. Who'd like to answer I know that? it's Iran and uh, Russia. Got it. Thank you. We got it. Okay, Who, who'd like to address that? Uh, just to be clear, what would be the alternative to U.S. pulling out? Was that I believe the, that's your question, right? Well, I, th I think, uh, you know, one alternative is to at least, and one obviously issue being discussed right now is uh, to keep at least a limited counterterrorism presence there that's under, that's 7,000 or under, and that focuses predominantly on uh, groups that threaten U.S. interests, Islamic State, Khorasan, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, maybe Lashkari Taiba, the group involved in the Mumbai attacks. The challenge with that, though, is uh, if that allows the Taliban to advance in the country in rural areas, uh, then you're creating a situation where there are some short-term steps to target terrorist groups, but you've got a much bigger long-term problem because the main insurgent group is gaining territory and we know historically has allowed some of these groups to operate in it. By the way, one of the challenges that I've had with the, the way the Afghanistan announcement came out recently was uh, I, I find it deeply counterproductive um, in announcing a, with, a, a downsizing of American forces at the very same time that we're trying to negotiate a settlement where the message the Taliban uh, almost certainly will get is, well, why do we reach a, a deal now if we, we can assess you guys are leaving? That's any bargaining 101, you talk now, but you won't reach an agreement because your odds are going to get better every year down the road because the U.S. presence declines. So I think from that perspective, how it was done was, I, I would have necessarily done it that way. Okay. Over here? How about here? Front row. Microphone. Right here. On the way. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to, I'd like to recommend, uh, commend John for the socks he's wearing today. They're quite attractive. Well, you know, this is TCU. <laughs> this exactly. is pretty this much is TCU. I've got them on too. The fundamental question I want to ask is we've been having a debate since the president announced the withdrawal that ISIS isn't defeated in Syria. Tell me when ISIS what are the metrics you would have used for the defeat of ISIS? And more importantly, how long would it have taken us to achieve those metrics, particularly with regards to the ideology? Nancy, why don't you talk about that? You've been over there. You've spent a lot of time in that, on those battlefields. Um, so, you know, there was, those metrics weren't spelled out explicitly when the U.S. intervened. It was to, it was at bo most to defeat the physical caliphate, that state where they had their own <coughs> land, taxes, government, um, and everything else. I, I think an argument that could be made for what a defeat would look like would be your, the idea of eliminating is sort of Pollyannish, perhaps. And so arguably the best way is to have a place where the Islamic State is one that can be sufficiently addressed by um, local security forces, by, by, by the U.S. in terms of protecting its own security, such that it's a mitigated threat. I mean, this, you know, the comparison I hear is sort of um, to be a police on, in a community. A, a police department doesn't get rid of the department, finds a way to be able to, to manage the threat to its community. And I think it's an interesting analogy that is applicable when you think about the, the ISIS threat. So that, that, I'm just, that would be one I would offer. Does anybody here think that ISIS has been defeated? No. I, I, don't, I don't think you can defeat ISIS any more than the war on poverty can defeat poverty, any more than the war on drugs can defeat drugs. Right? So I think it's the wrong metaphor, it's the wrong objective, which isn't to say that we don't have interests. But you know, what strikes me about ISIS is it's, and I think we talked about this in a previous G4 series, it morphs. And it will find any opening it can to act, whether it's onesies and twosies in Europe, whether it's, it's terrorist uh, events in Manbij or somewhere else. 
And when you set the bar so low for their success, which is they can slide a suicide bomber one place or some guy with a knife one place in Europe, and that gets them another year of success, then they keep winning and we keep losing, even if we're 99% effective. Why set up odds that way? That's very, very interesting. Well, let's have uh, a lady, a woman. There's one. There's one right here. There's one Where are the we? Back. Two. Two. Okay, right here. Hi, um, my question is, I, I tend to agree with the unpopular opinion that with the withdrawal from Syria, I don't think our job is to do the safekeeping for Syria. And then for Afghanistan, we've been there for 17 years. But uh, the, the speaker in the middle, sir, he had a question that if the, the space is not occupied by United States, then who will move in? So my question to the panel is, so what do you think of Russia getting possibly regional suprem supremacy in the area? And what will be the role of the United States? And, and do I understand your question? The recent events, have they benefited Russia? Is, well, that, is that basically what no, you're asking? My, I think my point is there is some logic in terms of saving resources for the United States. But I think I want to pursue his question that, OK, so if U.S. withdraw from those regions, I mean, from those areas, somebody more than likely will, will go in. And from what I see, Russia has a very good stronghold in that region. OK. And I want to ask the opinions of I understand. the panel. Have at it, panel. Who wants to answer that? Mm -hmm. uh, OK, I guess I'll, I'll start, uh, since it was my question. Um, <laughs> I mean, in, it's probably slightly less of an issue in Afghanistan and more right now in, in Syria. Uh, I, I think what we're seeing is a, is a more active Russia in Syria. It's, it's getting itself involved in the refugee return discussions. It's now got power projection capabilities that it didn't have uh, before 2015. It's got a, a access and more ships at, the, at, at uh, Tartus. It's got uh, more fighter jets and bombers in and around Latakia. Uh, so uh, it's the one, as we've discussed earlier, that's uh, in part been um, discussing with the Iranians on one side and the Israelis on the other and trying to mediate that dispute and keep the, the conflict to a, a limited level. On a recent trip that John and I were in Lebanon, we had a, a senior uh, Lebanese official tell me that the Russians were now you know, a major power in the Middle East in, in ways that have outstripped the US presence. So that's the downside of leaving, is uh, the Russians become a more active military power in the region and a more important diplomatic and intelligence power in the region. OK, uh, John, did you want to say? 30 seconds. I think the Russians always have much lower ambitions than the United States. The US is trying to create systems and processes and, and you know, create dynamics and all those things, and the Russians Oftentimes, they'll prop something up. They'll try to eliminate a group. They're not looking to do what the US does. And I, you know, I, I'm constantly struck that in Syria, you had a three-country coalition beat a 65-country coalition, which the US helped lead. And it was partly because they were looking to do so much less. Melissa. Yeah, and I think just to, to build upon John's point, I think it's also important to moderate our expectations of what Russia can do, whether it's in Syria or more broadly in the region, because of their own capacity issues, their own political and economic constraints at, at home um, that, that can serve as a check. That said, I think it is concerning to the United States strategically, politically, and certainly wearing my defense hat in terms of us, the United States, having to second guess um, our ability to, to operate in the region, um, to rely upon certain allies and partners in the ways that I think we have grown quite comfortable um, and maybe complacent uh, about over the last several decades um, that will require um, some reinvigoration. I'm very sorry, but this is gonna have, this, that's gonna have to be, well, we'll take one more question. Do you have a question? Yes. Front row. We have to wait for a Here comes the mic. Here goes. You still have to wait for a Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. 
And this definitely has to be the last question because some of our panelists have other obligations. How, how safe do you think the Kurds will be once we leave? With Erdogan not, um, how, how much do you trust what er Erdogan is saying? And, uh, I think that's a great question because the one thing we have that hasn't come up here, who'd like to address that? Well, um, so the Kurds right now, I think, will, will start trying to negotiate for their own security. They'll start talking to the Assad regime. Um, the advantage that they have is for all the talk of the Turks moving into Syria and taking, going all the way down to the Merv. Logistically, it would be very hard for them to move to roughly 200 miles down and, and, and carry out the kinds of operations that they promised the U.S. that they could do. I mean, they've had problems getting over the border just logistically. And I think there has been a real effort to mitigate as much as, they, as it can, the United States has, the risk to the Kurds. It's why you're hearing that the United States will continue to do strikes if necessary. It's why the French will still be there. It's why there's even talk of having U.S. forces go back and forth and interact, that there's some effort to try to um, mitigate that risk. And I also think the Kurds are trying to reach their own deals with, with forces on the ground. And so the, the short answer is, I don't know. Um, I do think that there's a serious effort being made, though, to contain the, the aspirations of those who in Turkey who want to use this as an opportunity to move in and take out what they see as a, a terrorist threat. I just, I just think, uh, but it's sort of an ongoing issue in terms of how that's going to resolve itself, in part because I think Turkey's still working out what it's going to do. The US is working out what it can do to support, and the Kurds are still trying to work it out what agreements they can make on the ground to, to address the possible threats to them. Yeah, with that, I'd say thanks to all of you on behalf of TCU and CSIS. <laughs> really appreciate your coming. Hi, everyone. My name's Mike. I'm the creator of Mox News. And uh, for the last 15 years, I have been telling you that uh, as long as I have the support of the community that I serve, Mox News will post videos forever. And that's the truth. As long as I have your support, no one could ever make me stop. Unfortunately, currently, less than one half of one tenth of one percent of Mox News viewers ever donate, tip, or contribute anything back. Again, let me make that really clear. Much less than one half of one tenth of one percent ever give anything back. And to those of you who have donated to Mox News, I want to thank you so much because it's because of your generosity that we have been able to bring attention to important videos that millions and millions of eyes would have never seen. And I think that that's a, 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 an amazing thing that we've been able to make happen together. And I can't thank you enough for helping me make that happen. So it's not too late. If you'd like to see Mox News covering the 2020 presidential election, if you can't imagine the 2020 presidential election without Mox News, please, there's still time. You can make a difference. It's easy to make a contribution, donation, or tip. Uh, you can go to moxnews.com or in the text body of this video, there are clickable links to the Patron page or to um, the PayPal page. And, and Again, it should take less than two minutes to make a donation, and your donation can make a big difference. So I thank you all. Stay cool. One of these days this war is going to end, and it would be awesome if Mox News could be there to celebrate that day with you.